I listened to a, a sermon uh, the other day, Bill Johnson. Um, he, he mentioned, so it's not Byron saying, it's he said. And it was so significant when, when, I, when I prepared for Victory Weekend and even going into this, this month, because this month for us is, is building up towards Easter. And building up towards Easter, significant uh, uh, um, uh, moment for us as, as believers, our sons and daughters of, of God, going into the Easter time, remembering what God did, remembering what Christ did for each one of us. And he said the following, he said, um, nobody followed Jesus because he had the prosperity ministry. But people followed him. Nobody followed Jesus because he had the political party. But people followed him. Nobody followed Jesus because he had the, 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 the law and the authority and everything. Um, uh, 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 you know, all the, the Pharisees and, and everybody in his pocket and guiding them. No, they followed him for who he was. He had the, the kingdom mindset of the authority. And that's why people followed him and that was even before the cross before the cross happened people followed him and there was something inside of Jesus that that people just wanted to draw near to him they wanted to to spend time with him I don't know if you've ever experienced that with someone maybe you've met someone and then you just felt like man I just want to be with that person um, when when God dropped in my heart that Karine is going to be my wife that moment, from that moment on, every time that I could spend or, or search to be with her, I wanted to be with her. I wanted to get to know her better. Hopefully she the same with me. But, but, but I had, I, I had that, that feeling, you know, that, that in love feeling. Okay? And when we when we seeking Jesus, may that be the same. May, may when we look at the cross be the same. That I want to be with him the whole time. I want to be with him. And people followed him because they, they saw something different in him. And, um, and I really believe it's because he had a, he left the heavenly kingdom. He brought it to earth and he left that. Uh, Romans 14, 17, one of my favorite scriptures says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And, and significant, when you go do a study in, in the Word, you, you read that righteousness means to have right standing with God. Wherever in the Bible you read the word righteousness and you go to the root of that, you see that it means it's to, to have a right standing with God. But, but in Romans 14, 17, that righteousness means to have the right thinking in God. It's, it's a different way of living. And then the scripture says, um, the, the, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not having the best cars and material things and all of that. No, it's, it's have the right thinking. And then it says, um, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. And, and, and some of you have heard me say this many times, and that's something that I live by, that, that if I can ask you two to come stand here, yes. You're not going to dance or, or stalk. You, you can't stand this side. So imagine this is peace. Say hi, hello to peace. This is peace. Look peacefully. Let everybody can see peace. You see peace. <laughs> and you see joy. Look joyful. Like you see joy. So wherever I move, you move with me. So wherever Byron walks, joy, joy and peace is with me wherever I go. Even if I go to school or work or wherever I go, joy and peace is following me. And that is how I can make the kingdom a reality in today to have the right thinking in every situation. So I want to tell you that if you, um, uh, you have mentioned, maybe you had a rough day or a rough week. And sometimes we have these rough things because we fired peace and we fired joy. It's not someone, the devil or someone else. No, it is me that was irritable or tired. And then I just let joy and peace go. And then I'm alone. And, and I see joy and peace. Now follow me. I didn't fire you. Now joy and peace is with me wherever I go. Whatever circumstances I find myself in. If it is with your parents. If it is with your children. If it is with work. Wherever. 
May joy and peace be with you. But the only way you can get that with you the whole time is within the Holy Spirit. If you don't have that, joy and peace is not there. So for most people, they live their lives and believe that joy, that money brings joy and peace. I want to tell you, no, money doesn't bring joy and peace. Maybe you sit here and think, no, only if I had won the lotto or I had that million rand, I'll be joyful. You'll be joyful for a moment. But nothing changed inside. Jesus walked on this earth knowing that he had a bodyguard of joy and peace wherever he go. The Holy Spirit is in. Thank you. Give joy and peace a hand. So every time you see them, imagine joy and peace is with you. But... So for me, that is how I make the kingdom a reality in today's life. So just short testimony, three weeks back or two weeks back, um, my, uh, uh, you know, in town, yeah, checkers, you have these um, motorcycles, 66, 66, eh? 66. So uh, it, it works. You, we, we, have, we are talking about getting them, but after what happened, we're still deciding. Um, we didn't fire our joy and peace. So what happened is my wife and daughter were coming from Kayla's um, horse riding uh, exercise and he, um, just passed the robot and then this motorcycle rode in the back of the Amarok, you know, broke many things. So when you look at it, it's uh, maybe 10 grand, 20 grand, I fix it, it's fine. That is, that's. So I took it to the panel beaters and I got the quotation, 46,000 rand. And I'm like, Wow. Okay, so still waiting. Today I had to ask Joy and Peace to stay with me when I spoke to the consultants of Outsurance because I'm the, we are the victim of this accident, but the victim now need to sort out the admin, which I don't understand like how that works, but okay, let's do it. And um, so, on, so that happened two weeks back. Tuesday, uh, uh, again, I was in Porch for meetings, and then I received a photo. My wife sent me a photo. So we tried to dro drive the uh, Amarok less because of the accident. There's a broken light and, and all of that. So, you know, net op nooit gevallen rij ons. And um, so then she sent me a photo of the ceilings of the garage fell on the, on the, on the Amarok, you know. And I was like, what did they try to do? Building, I, don't, I know we do homeschooling, but I know building is maybe one of the, but that didn't work. So just randomly that fell. And yesterday I received the quotation, 38,000 rand. And I'm like, man, I can buy a new car just of these two accidents. But why I share this is in all of that, joy and peace is with us. This morning, Came back from a mountain bike ride, was tired, it was hot. It's, and every time we put on the power, it trips, it power, it trips. And then the geezer um, element and thermostat, you know. So, so I can keep on telling you of all the, the sad things and, and, and why I share this is you can relate with that. Maybe you had a week like this or a couple of weeks like this. But I want to encourage you when we think about the cross. Jesus showed us how to live. Whatever circumstances come, joy and peace be with you. And you can only do that in the Holy Spirit. So what did God, what God did for me at the cross? And, and Luke 19 verse 10 gives us this, this picture of the purpose of why Jesus came to earth. And the purpose of Luke 19 um, verse 10, Jesus' purpose is, says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was Jesus' main purpose why he came to earth, is to seek and save the lost. Not to have the biggest ministry, not to, to, to build a political party, nothing, none, none of that. He came to seek and save the, the lost. And may we adapt that in when we work with people, when we disciple people, when you work with your families, may that be the, the focus point. Hebrews 12, verse 2 to 3 um, gives, says the following, says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of those of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Luke 9.62 talks about having put your hand on the plow and look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. 
And I see this practically. I know here in the Free State, there's a lot of farmers and, and Klomp Millilander. And if you, if you drove past it and you look to the side, you see these rows are nice in a row. And then you know that farmer is, is a perfectionist. You know, it's like everything is in, in a row. But if whoever plowed there or planted looked all around and went like this, those rows would have been chaos. And, and the same with us. May we fix our eyes on Jesus. May we fix our eyes on the cross so that we don't look back. Because when you do that, we will not be fit for the kingdom of God. And, and, and this is a sermon or a topic way on its own. But because looking back means keeping or getting stuck in your old life. Always going back to, you know, I get groot geword in brakpan, nou sal ek dood gaan in brakpan. No. It's, it's getting rid of those mentality and say, listen, God, there's a purpose for my life. And, and I can grow and I can fly and I can, can and achieve so many, many things. So the cross was the central message of the New Testament. Um, to understand and experience the cross, Christ, we must understand three things. And I want to touch on three things tonight. And the first thing is the suffering. When, when we look at the cross, we need to understand the suffering Christ went through. And there are many scriptures, and I'm just going to touch on some of them. Let me read this. Je Jesus suffered the pain of the cross because of our sins. This suffering was both in the Old and the New Testament message. Isaiah 53.10 says, uh, Isaiah prophesied the suffering of the Messiah. Um, it says, yes, it was the Lord who will to cross him and curse, uh, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life guilt offering. Jesus knew he must suffer in Matthew 16. Peter preached the suffering of Christ in Acts 3. Paul preached the suffering of Christ in Acts 17. Moses and the prophets foretold that Jesus would suffer in Acts 20, 26. Now, the cross was not the only form of, of death in those days. It was the most humilia humiliating way of dying in those days. Um, if you did something, something wrong um, or were evicted, uh, uh, it was the most humiliating death that people could, could, could bear going through. I want to take you quickly through a journey, but I want to ask you to close your eyes. So if we look at the cross, there are three things we need to think about. The first thing is the suffering. And while your eyes are closed, I just want to read to you some of the facts that Jesus went through before he, were, he was crucified. Part of that. So Jesus had 39 hits on his body. It was a handle that had nine leather strings on it where glass and bones were attached on it. So with this handle with nine leather strings, see it in your mind while your eyes are closed, Jesus was hit 39 times. Every hit pierced nine different areas on his body. 13 were in front of his body, and 26 at the back of his body. Psalm 129 verse 3 referred to his body as a plowed field after that um, hiding that he got. His robe hanged over his wounds and got stuck on it. It was ripped off again and again and again. It's like having a sore with a plaster and you take it off and, and it's not healed yet. And you, and you feel that pain touring in your body. The crown with thorns was not just a ring, but it, had, um, it was like a cap that filled over his head with long hooks and then pressed down on his head. The cross that he carried weighed 75 kilograms. From his head... To his side, to his feet, he was injured. He was mutilated. Squared nails, 15 centimeter long, was pierced through his wrists. The nails ripped from the wrist to the palms because of the weight when they pulled the cross in an upright position. And it's, Jesus had, he was in an inhaling position. It's like someone... That, that have an asthma attack, 
struggling to get breath. I hope you see that in your mind because this we need to understand when we talk about the cross. This is a suffering that Jesus went through for you. You can open up your eyes. I remember many years back we, we, uh, we sat and um, looked at that movie, The Passion of the Christ. And they showed, I don't know if some of you have seen it, and they showed the, the crucifixion and they had this surround sound and the blood dripping you know, as they show it, and you could hear the blood dripping. And, and my wife and blood walks like this. If she bl sees blood, she falls asleep. She passes out. <laughs> and I remember we in this big hall and thousands of people, and then she says, says Liffy, I had to get that out of there. Um, so sorry if it was so emotional. And, and, but, but I want to, to bring the point through that if we look at the cross, you need to understand the suffering. That Jesus went through. That's the first. The second thing is the substitution. Jesus took our place on the cross because of our sin and suffering, our punishment, so we would receive his righteousness. He stood in the gap. He, he came and, and he, he, he said the last words, it is finished. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5. So we see, when we look at the cross, we see the suffering. We hear there's a substitution that he stood in the gap for each one of us. And then the third thing, the salvation. Luke 19.10, which I've said, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1. And Jesus saves us from God's wrath, Romans 5, 9.10. So the first area when we look at the cross is, is the suffering, the second one is substitution, and the third one is salvation. It's, it's need to understand when you look at the cross, knowing that, that God the Father gave His best, His only, Jesus. Jesus gave His life. He gave it for you, so that you can be set free. So that you can experience victory. So that you can live a life with joy and peace wherever you go. That, that is, that is, that is the, the key of this, this kingdom that God wants us to live every day. So how should we respond to what Jesus did on the cross? So easy. The first thing you need to respond is to repent. Repent. Repent of all sins. Act 3 verse 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I remember the day when, when I got saved. I, I had to pray that prayer and ask God to forgive me. I had to repent of the Brakpan things that I did. But I had to repent it. And I want to encourage you. If you do Victory Weekend or you hear God life, is maybe there's an area in your life that you still need to repent. I want to encourage you tonight to do that. Repent. The second thing that we can respond to what Jesus did on the cross is we can receive the forgiveness of sin. You can receive the forgiveness. And this is a topic way on its own because forgiveness doesn't change the past. It enlarges the future. Forgiveness is not necessarily about that 66 person. It is for me. You know what I mean? The 66 who drove in the bucky had to forgive him. Now I sit with the admin, but I still need to forgive him. Yes, now it's a struggle and all of that, but joy and peace is with me. But I need to, 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 to receive the forgiveness. Acts 26 talks about it. And the third thing that we can respond to the cross is remember the price that he paid for our sins. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. Now the word teaches us that, that if, you, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ died and rose, you will be saved. And that's, that's the two key things. And, and I want to encourage you, if you've never said that or prayed that, may tonight be a moment like this. Maybe you've done it many years back, but you felt like you get stuck. And you can't grow. I don't know. When I talk to young people about prayer and, and Bible study, it's, 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 I use this term and say, sometimes you pray and it feels like your prayer stops at the ceiling. I don't know if you felt like this. 
You feel like, man, I'm praying and I'm praying. It doesn't go further. It feels like it. And then what do you do after a while? You just stop. You just don't pray anymore. The key is to press through, to keep on doing it, to, to build things in your life, to break through the ceiling if, if you think like that. And allow the Spirit to, to work in you and through you. So family, I want to encourage you tonight. When we talk about the cross, and even in, in March, going up to Easter, this next few weeks, go, go read, go meditate on what Christ did for you. The suffering. He, st he, he stood in the gap for you. And then there's a key, the salvation. Maybe you are discipling someone or you have friends or family that need to know God, you, you, you can be that light shining, guiding them, getting them to know Jesus.